Um, my name is Helen McNaughton and I'm chair of the Japan Research Center here at SOAS. And uh, I'd just like to mention that tonight's seminar is also a joint seminar with the Japan Economy Network or JEN, J-E-N. And that's run, uh, that's hosted at SOAS by um, my colleague Uli in the economics department. So Japan Economy Network is an informal network for academics as well as non-academics, think tanks, private organizations, NGOs, et cetera. Anybody interested in networking uh, and events particularly focused on the Japanese economy. So we're co-hosting this event tonight. So if you're interested in the Japan Economy Network, uh, you can find information on our SOAS website about it. Um, but it's my absolute pleasure to welcome tonight's speaker, uh, Ulrika Scheider who is Professor of Japanese Business at the University of California, San Diego. And she's very kindly joining us in the middle of her teaching in Admin Day. It's 11 o'clock in the morning in, in California. And uh, she's very kindly making use of a one week gap in the global calendar where we've gone off summertime and she's still on summertime. And we were actually, it was the only week that we were able to schedule the seminar at this, at this time. So, uh, so delighted that she's joining us from sunny California while we're now in officially in winter in the UK and in Europe. So she's going to be talking to us about Japan's business reinvention and it really follows on, uh, it's based on her latest book um, which is normally I would be holding up the book but I don't have it in my, I'm not in my SOAS office, I haven't been able to get into my SOAS office since March so I just printed it out but it's the Japan, um, the business reinvention of Japan, um, how to make sense of the new Japan and this has been published this year and it follows on from a previous book that she wrote, um, Choose and Focus. So uh, Japanese business strategies for the 21st century, uh, which was written, uh, which was published back in 2008. So she's going to talk us through her ideas, particularly the latest book, of course. Uh, the structure that we're going to follow tonight is that Ulrika is going to give us about a 30 minute presentation and then uh, Ulrich and I are going to have a little chat, uh, delve a bit deeper into some of the topics that she raises, uh, and then we'll open it up to the audience Q&A. And you can type into the chat your question and comments for Ulrika once we start the, the audience um, Q&A. So welcome, Ulrika. I'm delighted that you can join us. Uh, feel free to upload your presentation. I'm just going to switch off while you do that to... Uh, yeah, thank you for this great introduction, Helen. And thank you, and uh, thank you everybody for for joining. Um, I'm excited to be here. I would be even more excited if I could actually be in London, a, a, a city I love, and I hope that we can we can make that happen at some point in the future. So um, not too far. And so let me start with um, with my powerpoints so that we can I can give you a, um, a, a pretty brief run through what I mean by the business reinvention and, um, and, and why I wrote this book. So, um, all right. there we go. So, so the book is going to be very positive. Uh, it will talk about how Japanese companies have reinvented themselves and are um, uh, forceful competitors. And when I give this talk, there are usually many doubters they say, oh, you know, Japan has 20 years of stagflation and deflation, a, an aging, shrinking society. Isn't there atrophy in the regions? What about the government debt and the limited role of women and the inefficiencies and, and so forth and so on? I, I, I usually can uh, already, I can tell you that the productivity is not increasing. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a correct claim and that Japanese companies are not no longer innovative is also a wrong claim, but the other things are true. Uh, they're absolutely true. And um, and if you're interested in them, uh, please go to the bookstore. I'm sure you can find a, a very good analysis of what's happening in that part of Japan. But there's also, uh, that, but the, the question I'm interested in here is actually the opposite. My question is, how can it be that if this is all so bad, that after 20 years um, of, of bad news from Japan, Japan is still the third largest economy in the world, uh, measured by by just absolute GDP, and uh, and in fact, Japan does this with a workforce of about sixty five million people, which is you know roughly the size of China's three largest cities. So what is going on there? Um, and and the answer is that um, that while we were not looking, and while we were talking about the lost decades, 
Um, the Japanese, the leading Japanese companies that I'm going to talk about today have reinvented themselves. And, um, and they had to do that uh, because um, uh, they, had to, they had to do that by, by assuming a strategy that I will uh, label the aggregate niche strategy. And uh, they have done it also internally by changing their internal management processes. So if I had um, only, only two minutes to give you sort of the elevator pitch of, of, of what this book is about, um, I would say the book is about how Japanese companies have responded to the rise of China and the globalization of supply chains. So basically the change in the global competitive environment over the last 20 years. And they've done so by moving upstream to dominate a series of critical input markets. And that is the aggregate niche strategy that I will uh, explain in, in the slides that are to follow. Uh, the upshot of this is that Japanese companies now anchor many Asian supply chains. And this has created very interesting new dependencies uh, in the East Asia competitive setting. And uh, this is often misunderstood. And I think it is a misunderstanding to say that Japan has lost it and Japan is slow and so forth and so on. And the reason it's misunderstood is that uh, it is done in ways that are different from what American or even European observers might expect. And in fact, it is done very slowly, but that slow is for a reason. And slow does not mean stagnant. Slow is the price that Japanese society is willing to pay for a reorganization process that is, that, that is done while social stability is maintained. And so the final point is that that is interesting uh, for us uh, because Japan has found a way to balance social stability with economic success. And uh, the Japanese companies are showing us that reorganization and restructuring does not have to be messy, it does not have to come at a high social cost. And so Japan is, is, is maintaining an important alternative system of, of balanced capitalism that we might learn from. So that's the, that's the book. Now, uh, you might say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. How can you be so positive and yet say that it's true that there's stagflation and shrinking and aging and all of that? And, and the answer is that this is a, a situation of the, of the 2080 rule. You may have heard about this rule. And basically it says that that 80% of outcomes are explained by 20% of inputs. And so it is here. Uh, there, there are many inefficient Japanese companies and the inefficient parts of the Japanese economy. Uh, today, what I want to look at is the 20% of Japanese companies that account for 80% of the economic performance. I want to look at the, the good athletes, not the poor athletes. And I think that's important because uh, if we only look at the poor athletes, we're missing out on a very important story. Okay, so uh, so here's the book. Uh, it has ten chapters. Um, uh, you know, we begin with an introduction uh, and, and talk about business culture, which I will do a little bit uh, later on in my presentation here today. Um, and uh, then there are chapters on uh, Japan's new role in Asia in Asian business and global business. Uh, there's a chapter on corporate governance, a chapter on financial markets and private equity. And then I look inside the company on how the reinvention is managed in terms of changing corporate cultures towards new approaches of innovation. And I end on uh, a chapter on how Japanese companies are going to compete in the digital transformation. And what I wanna do uh, now first is I'm gonna introduce the core concept, the aggregate niche. All right, so why did Japanese companies have to reinvent? There are two main triggers. The first uh, is, uh, the, is that Japanese companies have lost the previous competitive advantage in mass producing high quality consumer end products. In the 70s and uh, 80s, you walk into any living room around the world, whether that was in, in, in Europe or in the United States, the TV was either a Sony or a, a Toshiba or a, a Panasonic, maybe a Hitachi. Uh, it was a made in Japan TV. Today, you walk into anybody's living room and it's an LG, it's a Samsung, it's some other brand, right? And that's why this, this disappearance of, of Japanese consumer end products is why people think that Japan has lost it. 
Um, and, and so, yes, that required a, a corporate response, a strategic response, right? And the second, um, uh, and the second reason that Japanese companies had to pivot is the globalization of supply chains. And I'll explain that in, in, in a moment. So Helen mentioned my previous book, which I wrote in two thousand, published in two thousand and eight. So I wrote in the early two thousands, and at the t and it was called Choose and Focus, which was my translation of the Japanese phrase Sentaku to Shuchu, which was the business catchphrase at the time, which means uh, refocusing, cho choose and focus, literally. Uh, the Japanese government translated it as uh, selection and concentration, but, but the, the, in strategy, we actually do have, you know, a, a concept of refocusing. And, and the, the book was about the fact that, that the post-war Japanese industrial success, so the success of the 20th, 20th century was, um, was expressed through size. Japanese companies won if they were big. The bigger was better. Um, the more sales, the better, the more employment, the better. Uh, size afforded them access to talent, technology, trade quotas, and all kinds of things. And then the bubble economy of the 80s added some exuberance and more diversification to that. Right? But the thing is, in the global economy, size no longer works. Uh, in the global economy, these companies have to do something else. They have to, they have to be profitable. They have to attract uh, shareholders through profits. They have to be agile and nimble and innovative. So what we saw, uh, what I observed in this book was a first round of refocusing where companies exited, sold out, reorganized. And it was a, it was a big push. Uh, and what we know now from hindsight is that mostly what they did at the time is they exited, they parted uh, with the low hanging fruit, the non-performing or the non-career businesses. Uh, the challenge is, so this is the second book now, um, by 2019 as of today, uh, Japan still has or ha has or had uh, more than 250 conglomerates defined as companies with 50 subsidiaries, widespread subsidiaries, right? And the, the challenge with that is a conglomerate discount in the stock price and uh, that they were still stooped in old processes you know, of, of, of that. And, uh, and so to do, respond to the rise of China, they now need to choose and focus on sort of version 2.0. So why am I bringing in the Sumo here? Uh, let me talk a little bit about Sumo. And, and those of you who've been around the block may remember from the, from the high days of Sumo and the, in the bubble years, these two uh, star athletes, Konishki and Akebono. These were massive men. Uh, had they grown up in Texas, I'm sure they would have been, you know, brilliant linemen in the American uh, Football League. Uh, they were Sumo and one was six feet, 600 pounds, and the other was seven feet, 500 pounds big. They had a competitor called Maino Umi, who soon, uh, be, you know, rose to the popularity, to the top of the popularity chart. Maino Umi was actually too short for the Samoa Association's um, uh, rules. He was only 173 centimeters, so he had some silicon inserted in his scalp so that he would make the cut, and he weighed all of uh, 200 pounds. And he became known and popular uh, as the store of superior techniques, Waza no de Pato. And um, he, in this particular picture here, he, uh, let me see whether I have a, uh, uh, they, he, he, he trips up this opponent while grabbing the other leg and pushing in with his shoulder. And so this fellow here is gonna topple over uh, any moment now. And so he introduced to Sumo a new way of competing, and that is through techniques and technologies. And I'm bringing this up because it's a fabulous image of what, uh, what, what Japan's new approach to international competition is, which is to outsmart, to be agile, and to be quick on the feet. Okay, so um, uh, uh, what, what's going on here? So, so the globalization of supply chains uh, has made this uh, possible and necessary. So let me, uh, you, you may have seen this, a so globalization basic of supply chain means that the, that the, the stages of production are cut uh, into their, uh, each, each, each stage. And then each of this happens in different countries. So in the case of the iPhone here, 
Uh, the iPhone is, of course, uh, designed in, in Cupertino and in California, and then uh, the input materials and components, as well as the production machinery, are made in Japan. Uh, Taiwan and South Korea make input parts like panels and, and, and things like that, and the assembly is happening in China, and then the retail is back in our glitzy stores around here. And what the Japanese companies were realizing is that they had lost the cost advantage in this pocket here, that they could not compete with China in low uh, end, you know, toaster ovens and blow dryers and so forth. And so therefore, to escape this competitive realm, they moved up. Um, the, the smile curve, which is, is, is this thing, so it's sort of a U-shaped curve that maps operating margin by stage of production. This was then first drawn by the former CEO of Acer, the computer company uh, from Taiwan, uh, Andrew Shi uh, drew this on a napkin in a restaurant and said, we're in trouble because Acer is here. We're an assembler, assembler of uh, laptop computers, but there's no money here. The money is here or here. This is sort of a, a bad spot. And so this is what this reinvention is about. The Japanese companies have realized that this is a bad spot. And, and, and the, the, some of them are playing here like SoftBank and Uniqlo and so forth. But the manufacturing firms that I'm talking about here today have moved upstream into components and materials. So we, uh, somebody did a study 10 years ago that took apart the iPhone and they realized that in terms of the total cost of making the iPhone at the time, it was $180. 34% of this value added accrued in Japan, 17% in Germany and China with its assembly only, only contributed 3.6% to the value added. And so my question when I first saw this 10 years ago was who is that somebody? Who, who's making this money? And, uh, and so and here's the, the answer. So this is my bubble chart, no worries, I will explain. Um, so uh, this is the global market size uh, of a set of a thousand products that were um, uh, investigated for this purpose. So this is a 1 billion to a trillion. And this is the combined global market share of Japanese companies in percent, right? So this is 100. Uh, let me explain how this goes. So the size of the bubble indicates the size of the, uh, the, the power of the, uh, of the market. So the combination of these two. So this is automobiles. And we know that Japanese companies uh, have a 30% market share in automobiles. And this is the Prius and other hybrid cars like the Nissan Leaf and electronic cars. So uh, uh, Japanese companies have 80% of the global market share in those. What I want to draw your attention to are the bubbles down here, the sort of the Milky Way of tiny little spots. And these are input parts and components in electronics and automobiles, and maybe also some one biotech here. Uh, where Japanese companies control 100% of the world market share. And so this is a, you know, sort of an increased size bubble. So uh, this is an analysis that, that METI did in uh, the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry in Japan did, did in uh, 2018. They looked at 931 global product categories. This is not a scientific exercise with a picked particular industries, uh, but that's fine. It, it completely uh, maps what I, what I learned from the CEOs that I was talking to in Japan. There are uh, roughly 500 product categories where Japanese companies combine to more than 50% of the market. The average market size of these is roughly 5 billion. So you can do the math, uh, 500 times 2.5 billion, that adds up. And, um, and what's important to know here is that this is not sort of hidden champions, small little companies. This is large listed companies and some of them double down and have um, controlling shares in, in several of these. Um, and, so, uh, and so this is the new competitive thrust of successful, Japan's successful manufacturing firms. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, doesn't every country have you know, some sort of pockets of, of invention and, and dominance? And the answer is no, not really. Uh, this is South Korea, same, same thing. And so South Korea, of course, has automobiles and cell phones and, and, and uh, televisions and LCD panels, but, and, and semiconductors, of course, but they have nothing here, almost nothing. One, one type of uh, semiconductor. 
the United States has some stuff, mostly pink. Pink is farmer. So this is the US biotech industry. And then of course also semiconductors uh, and the US car companies uh, kind of losing it a little bit, I guess. Um, and so back to Japan. So, so this, this, this is a, what I call the aggregate niche strategy. So there are all these little niches and then there's large companies that have several of these, of these competitive niches and, um, and it adds up. And so therefore in the aggregate, this is a winning strategy. Okay, so here's, uh, I've already said all of this. Uh, so there are actually 57 critical input products where Japanese companies have 100% market share, which means that somebody else is dependent on them, right? And so the companies that do this are, are, are you know, some of them, you know, uh, the companies with the name of Mitsui and Mitsubishi, Fujifilm, JSR is big. Um, and so this is a, this is a big, big uh, com competitive play. And uh, just so that uh, to update this, uh, somebody at Nikkei did a study of the Huawei 2019 phone and they found that Japanese companies contributed 23% of the global, of the value added, but that didn't count where South Korea and Taiwan and these Chinese companies got their input chemicals from. Mostly, by the way, this is in the chemical industry. It's fine chemicals for, um, for consumer electronics, like the, the films, the polarizer films in this panel, the, the touch sensitivity of this panel. It could be, you know, some, some connectors here, uh, you know, chips here, but a lot of this is, is, is actually chemicals and, and chemicals that go into things like batteries. Okay, so the implications of this is that Japan, Japanese companies now anchor the Northeast Asian trade supply chain and supply chains, right? And they have to change their core identities to, uh, <clears throat> to, to be these technology leaders and to compete at the technology frontier. So this is uh, just on the trade side. I looked at trade data 2018, it's the latest I could get <clears throat> and find. What we see here is that uh, Japan and China are roughly equal. So they trade $180 billion each every year. And, uh, and so that's, that's about equal. But Taiwan and South Korea have a trade deficit with Japan. And China has a trade deficit with Taiwan and South Korea. And what they're trading are these input materials and, and components that then are assembled in China. So, that is, <clears throat> so that's the aggregate niche story. It's a technology play that currently affords uh, Japanese companies great competitive advantage. And of course, you could also look at that picture and say that Konishiki is, you know, is, is, is China and, and, uh, and my Umi is, is, is the new Japan, is, is a new agile, competitive, high tech, you know, waza no depato, uh, uh, leader in, in deep technologies. Okay. So let me add one more wrinkle to this and, and, and then I'll open this up because I, I want to hear the questions that, that you might be having on this. But 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 clearly the question that you would ask is this thing about so okay so how can Japanese companies change their corporate culture? They used to be, you know, driven by kaizen and 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 and, and manufacturing. As I said, right, repeatedly I've said that they were the the manufacturing leaders, and now they're playing at the front at the competitive frontier with breakthrough innovation. How can they do this? And and in fact. That is the, the, the reason why this is such a slow process. It, it, by, the, by the time this will be done, it will have taken Japanese companies 20 years to reposition themselves, to go on. This is a massive diet, right? So uh, to, to get at this, let me just uh, go into culture real quick. So I posit in the book that there are three basic rules of Japanese business culture. That, and, and those are to be or appear to be polite, don't be loud, don't argue, don't complain, to be appropriate. Um, and let me give you an example. Uh, you know, if, if, if somebody in Japan were to, were to color their hair green and go to their office, people would find that inappropriate and they would, they would ask, you know, that green hair is not, it's just not done, be appropriate. And uh, be considerate, uh, which stands for don't, don't rock the boat, don't, don't cause an inconvenience. Don't, don't choose actions that, that cause trouble for others, right? So those are the three main rules. And, and happily, 
most people in Japan get away if they with doing two of those right, right? So you could be a reformer and rock the boat if you do it very politely and in ways that are completely appropriate. Or you could actually be impolite in Japan. It's, 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 it's okay if you don't rock the larger boat and if you, if you otherwise are completely appropriate in your attire and so forth. So two out of three is, is important here. And, uh, and so what, where I'm going with this, uh, I'm going with uh, how can you uh, support Japanese business culture uh, while you're pushing for breakthrough innovation. And the framework that I'm using in the book to explain this is called tight loose theory. This is a new framework in international business that um, comes out of social psychology and, and cultural anthropology. And it defines culture as the, a set of norms that guide our behavior. And these are culture are socially created standards, standards that shape our expectations. And, um, and in general, uh, social psychologists think of psychologists think of culture as having three components. There's the content, which is the prescription, which I just gave you, right? So in Japan's case, be be polite, be appropriate, don't don't rock the boat. Then there is a second dimension, which is consensus. To what degree do people agree that that these norms are important? And the third is the intensity with which they feel this. That is the extent to which deviance is tolerated. And the framework then divides uh, into tight and loose. And this is a very carefully done, um, uh, oops, let me, just, let me just go to this, a very carefully done uh, study where uh, Michelle Gelfand uh, uh, from Stanford and, and her colleagues went, went around 33 countries and um, asked, almost 7,000 respondents questions like, is it okay to eat in the elevator? Is it okay to read a newspaper in the park? Is it okay to kiss at a funeral? Is it okay to wear headsets uh, in a restaurant? And, um, and then they could measure to what extent people agreed, yes, that's okay, that yes, that's not okay, whether they were all over the, you know, the spectrum, or, and to what extent um, the, the answers reflected that people were, were quite intolerant toward deviance. And so they get this thing where they have Norway as the tightest of the countries that they studied. Uh, and Japan and South Korea uh, are also up here. Uh, and uh, the UK is in, in the middle and the United States is uh, a quite, quite a loose place. The, not as loose as New Zealand or the Ukraine, but but quite loose. So with my image, with my example of the green hair, so if a, if a Japanese came to the office with green hair, people would be quite concerned about whether he's, he or she is okay. In California, you know, my colleague shows up with green hair, you know, people would say, well, that's cute. There's nothing to think about. So, um, so Japan has a tight culture, right? And, and by the way, this is enforced um, not because Japanese are Japanese. This is a, this is a global phenomenon, right? So Nor Norway is even tighter uh, than, than Japan and India is tighter than Japan. And, and the way this is done is through social proof, the, the, this human desire to, to, to fit in and to just behavior to those around us, right? It's not innate, it's socially constructed. So I brought you a little video to see, uh, let me see whether I can, I can actually show this. Can I, uh, oh, 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 how do I click this button? No, it doesn't want to go. Uh, oh, I have to click here. Okay, so this is a an experiment that they ran in the United States many, many years ago. It's very old. It's very, very rough. Okay, of course. Again. It's the Here's elevator the example. Something. Here comes the king of Pakistan. We are in the Middle East. So the guy who's looking at us is the subject here. And these people, of course, all look towards the wall in the elevator. And he turns. This has been replicated uh, recently. They did it with a student group and the student turned. Everybody else looking to the wall. The student also turned. They asked her, why did you turn? And she said, I thought you knew something that I don't know, right? So that's the power of social proofing. Uh, we, we are in an environment, everybody is doing something. We want to fit in, we do the same thing. 
And, and the reason I'm showing you this is that corporate culture is this. Uh, the elevator is the company um, or your organization, or in fact, uh, Helen, your classroom, right? Uh, my classroom. Uh, the, the, ele the company is the elevator. When people show up to work in the morning, um, people, new hires come to work, they will take their cues from their environment and they will try to fit in. Uh, and they will do this even more. They will have an even more sensitive social radar if they are in a tight culture where uh, there's, there's, no, there's not a whole lot of tolerance for deviance. And all, all of us who have been to Japan know this, right? Um, uh, foreigners who come to Japan, uh, after some time they start bowing on the, on the, on the cell phone or we, we get very, very um, uh, exact with how we separate our garbage because we know if we don't, then you know somebody will come and teach us how, how to do that. So, um, so then that becomes the puzzle, right? So, how do you change the behavioral norms in a tight culture setting? And that is the task that the CEOs in Japan are currently uh, uh, pursuing, right? Um, the and the answer is they can't change tightness. Japan will always be tight tighter than the US. They can't just say, hey, everybody be loose now and you know, become innovative and switch from uh, be a conscientious order taker in the Toyota production system to being a, um, a break it, fix it, risk taking innovator. Right? You, you can't just order people to do that. What we need to do, what, they, what the Japanese CEOs are, are doing currently is they're working hard to redefine what the right behavior is, right? So, so there will always be, you know, a tendency to think you have to be appropriate and polite and you should not rock the boat, but what is appropriate needs to be redefined, right? And that is, uh, that is why this process of culture change is taking so long because uh, you, to, you, to, to, to make a tight culture loser, uh, they, they actually have to use tight mechanisms like um, very carefully structured uh, workshops and, 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 and you know, uh, sign-ups and, and processes and meetings uh, and, and in which they tell people to be more loose. Um, and this is already happening now in offices. And, and so this is one of the ways in which CEOs do this. And then I'll, I'll let you... Uh, then I'll open up the, the conversation. Uh, so there's three ways that, that I identify in the book where uh, this is happening. Uh, one is open innovation strategies. This is a, the, the Japanese for this is open innovation. And it actually doesn't mean open innovation. It, it literally, uh, in a very narrow sense of the word means, uh, let's open up our R&D uh, departments and bring in outside researchers um, and go to Silicon Valley and purchase startup companies and new innovation streams, and um, maybe do some more proactive hiring of foreign staff. There's also office redesign. I brought you pictures here. So one is the old uh, standard Japanese office with a lot of sleeping going on in this particular picture and a lot of paper and it's all cluttered and, and uh, very rigid. The latest thing in Tokyo, whether that was inspired by WeWork or not, is the free address office. And the free address office is very interesting because it causes a big problem for Japanese employees. In the old office down to the right, um, the employees basically impress their bosses by putting in long hours and hard work. And that they were so exhausted that they would have to take a nap in between, but still that counted as work hours, right? And so they would be there and they would be conscientious. They would do exactly as told. In the free address office, this is no longer possible. The free address office is an office where the employee has a locker and every morning when they come to work, they pick where they want to be for the day. Do they need to be in a sofa? Do they need to be at a table? Do they need to find a meeting room? Uh, do they need to be in a hammock uh, to be creative? And, uh, and so, so the, free, the new free office undermines the old processes of HR evaluations. I and mean, that is a very interesting phenomenon where, uh, at, at, and at first where this is happening, it's met with great unease. Uh, the employees don't like it. They don't know how to impress their boss. 
and they it's be, beginning to dawn on them that in the new Japan, it's not no longer about process. It's about outcome. It's about showing what you've done. It's about getting it done and then showing what you've done and being being impactful. And that will take a long time. You can't just tell people to to switch from process to outcome. You have to make you have to create buy-in for this. Otherwise, you you get boycotts, right? You have to do this very very carefully and slowly. And the labor cho- shortage is is helping with this greatly. And and if you're interested in this, we can we can uh, take this on later. But but so let me. Uh, let me let me just stop here because I've been talking too much, Afia, and uh, let me stop my share and uh, and and invite Helen to join me here for for a conversation so that we can maybe uh, delve more into the topics that you think your audience is most interested in. Thank you. Thanks, Ulrika. That was that was brilliant. That was a really good um, explanation of the, some of the core. Uh, insights in your research and book and 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 lovely and visual as well I love the little bubbles that was really that was really good um and I, I now understand 30 years after moving from New Zealand to uh the UK via Japan that I've moved from a loose culture to a tight culture and now I understand some of the problems I first encountered when I when I came to the UK so it's put it into perspective for me um so I'm just going to ask you a little bit more about your uh, aggregate niche value. Um, so you said that obviously Japanese companies are moving up the smile and they're also moving upstream as well, um, up, upstream in the supply chain. So uh, I think you hinted a little bit at this, but how how are they doing this? Are they investing a lot more in R&D budgets? Are they utilizing joint ventures and M&As uh, and, and you know, strategic partnerships? Are they linking up with universities or other consortia uh, as they used to do previously, or are they doing it differently? And are, are they still using Japanese practices like Kaizen that you you briefly mentioned? So how are they going about that moving up the smile curve and, and, and going upstream? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, so the Kaizen and all of the all of the um, the previous mechanisms of making great products are still super important, right? Because we're talking fine chemicals here, and that's a tacit knowledge manufacturing industry, right? So you need to have, you need to maintain and in fact enhance uh, the capabilities in manufacturing. At the same time, you need to have parts of the organization that are speedy and nimble and agile and at the frontier of technology. So what these companies are doing is they're, they're adopting ways of what, what's called ambidexterity. Uh, so do do both, right, and and find the right balance and and, and manage these two cultures uh, in, in in one company. Uh, and so on the research side, then, so first of all, they're they're still getting better. So Toyota production system is not done, right? It's, it's getting better and better and better. And now we're going to have digital manufacturing, and Japanese companies are going to be on the forefront of this new industry 4.0 and the edge computing and the you know the, the that whole that whole part. So, so we see innovation there. At the deep tech frontier, uh, Japanese companies have, I, I briefly mentioned Okun Innovation, right? So they've realized that they can't quite do it with the old stodgy R&D departments of the old because they had a not invented here syndrome, but they were kind of, you know, there was very little cross fertilization due to life and employment. So to, 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 to get them going, uh, we, we have these various processes of opening up uh, companies to m so purchase startups. There's also at the same time, the government is very active in setting up innovation, a new innovation ecosystem, and have startup support programs. And uh, society is warming up to the idea that there are careers other than being a salary man at a very large company, right? That, that it's actually, it could be successful to be you know, an innovator. Uh, that's slow also, but it's happening a little bit. And um, and uh, very quietly, uh, the large companies, even some where that we've written off as, as lost and in, in, admired in their in their old ways of doing things, are um, are focusing on a set, a clearly defined set of competencies that they're pushing. So let me give you the example of Hitachi. 
which I actually had written off uh, earlier, 20 years ago, I thought Hitachi was, was definitely going the wrong way. They had something like a thousand subsidiaries. They were like huge. And, um, and they were playing in, in way too many things. They were doing everything from nuclear power plants uh, in the UK, in fact, right, to, um, to, to toaster ovens. And, and and blow dryers and so forth. There's no way that that can become a you know a winning strategy. Over the last 20 years, Hitachi has not only greatly slimmed down to become this more nimble Mayanarumi, they're even sell, now selling off their crown jewels. So they have mm-hmm. parted with Hitachi Chemical last year. They have um, uh, just last week sold off Hitachi Construction. They have spun out and sold off uh, Hitachi Medical, even though that was a $10 billion business. And they have instead bought uh, some microgrid technology from ABB that, where they're now gonna be, they're gonna be in smart cities, mm-hmm. smart energy and transportation as a service. Right? That's the new Hitachi and a, and a integrated data solution provider. It was maybe similar to IBM a little bit. And it took IBM 10 years to, to get from mainframes and, 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 and computers to, to Watson and, and what IBM is today, right? And so, uh, so Hitachi is doing something very similar. And that requires that they build out new R&D capabilities, right? And I could tell you the same story about Asahi Glass, which is a window maker that is trying to push the envelope on, um, on, on 5G uh, antennas or something, right? And uh, uh, NEC, which is a big player in AI, and yes, massive uh, investments in R&D to play mm. the fund. And so they sell off, they carve out um, some of their actually previous core components. Not only are they selling off sort of the leftovers or the non-performing stuff, but, but actually viable businesses. Mm. And that, by the way, has, the, has uh, fed into a budding private equity market in, in Japan, which is one of the hottest markets right now in, in dealing corporate assets. So it's a, it's, it's a very, and, and again, I'm only talking about the 20% good companies, right? So there, there are oh, lots yeah. of companies that are not doing this, but the ones that are doing this are, are uh, very committed to the R&D aspect of it. Yeah, great. So you said that even, um, so you've talked about some of the big brands there, and you said that even those little bubbles that you showed uh, are, are, are big companies rather than SMEs. So can you give us a sort of insight into what's happening with the SME sector, although maybe it doesn't come into that 20% that you're looking at? What's happening with, you know, Kdetsu supply chains? Are they just breaking down as, as this process happens? And, and obviously, we're not going to see, um, you know, big brands like Toyota and Hitachi disappear anytime soon. But as you said, you know, we no longer walk into people's kitchens and, and uh, lounges and see some of the brands that we used to see so visibly. So even though big companies are still very competitive, uh, they may be, you know, selling off viable entities and, and specialising. Do you see? Do you see some of those brands as becoming perhaps less visible as Japanese brands because they're moving in up upstream and into the input side of things, or, or will we always see uh, Japanese brands maybe not on end consumer products as much, but in the marketplace? What's your view on the brands and the big business SME relationship? Right. So that's already happened, right? So the living room is already, you know, I mean, I'm, I, I still have a Sony TV, but I think that beats <laughs> me. Uh, so, so the, the, and, and, and by the way, that's, that's not, that's not bad, right? That, that's not a bad thing. Moving upstream. Uh, yes, there, there's no Japan inside label on, on the screen that you're looking at right now, but there is Japan inside. Mm. For, with a hundred percent certainty, there's a Japanese part in your computer that in the, in the screen that you're looking at right now, right? And so that's where the money is. So that's a good thing because there's no money in in making assembling that thing. So making the expensive part that goes into it, that's a good strategy, right? So that's not a concern. It's just a misunderstanding. So so this Japan and side label does not exist, but I. I, I bet that there's not a day in your life that goes by where you're not using a Japanese product 
uh, whether that's when you start your car or you drive your car, it's a microcontroller. There's a, there's a 0.4 probability that that's from Japan, right? And so uh, the, the motors in your car, you know, windows, wiper, all of that, the, these little motors are made in Japan and so forth and so on. So, so that's, I, I'm not concerned about the fact that the consumer end product has gone away. That, that's a yeah. solid strategy. The SMEs is a very interesting question because uh, what we see there is more of a bifurcation. And so in the old Japan, you know, Toyota had its, its supplier hierarchy and, um, and, and the, the whole ship would, you know, always, you know, they were dependent on Toyota, but Toyota would also take responsibility for them and, and make sure that they would make it through the, any recession and so forth. That started to go to disappear with the globalization. Right, so when the U.S. and Japan had a trade war, which is like now feels like a long time ago, but it was very similar to what we see now between the U.S. and China, right? And so in the U.S.-Japan trade war basically ended when uh, when when the Americans had, had these voluntary export restraints and the Japanese companies had to um, set up plans in the U.S. or somewhere in, in, in Canada or Mexico and NAFTA. And so that's how we ended up with uh, all these Honda par companies in, in Ohio and Toyota and Kentucky and so forth. And the, then the first year suppliers went with them. And so the first year suppliers are now these very strong players and they're very innovative and they're very important and they're, they're fine. And the fourth year suppliers got lost. And that is definitely true, right? They they got lost. They they, they were left behind in Japan, and there there's no that, that's the atrophy in the regions and the shrinking. And, the, and, and that, that's not a good story, definitely. By the way, the whole iPhone story is actually an SME story because you may recall that um, NTT Docomo had the iMode phone in something like 2001. And this could go on the internet and do all kinds of fancy things at a time when we thought of a phone as something that we speak on and no more, right? And iMode already had, you know, the internet access and you could order things on and you could see things and so forth. And so the iMode never became a global standard, but when Apple developed its iPhone, in 2006, I want to say, up, it came out in 2000. So, it, so in the early 2000s, um, they were looking for suppliers to make the iPhone. And where did they find them? But in Japan, because the iMode had already, you know, the making iMode phones had already geared up all of these Japanese suppliers and making smaller, you know, connectors, screens, you know, capacitors, antennas and so forth so um so, so the the sme story is is shifting it's uh, yes the japanese hierarchies the cadets the vertical cadets may be falling apart but the strong smes are now just feeding into other into mm -hmm. other cadets yeah. and some of those bubbles are those companies that are now large and listed so in many ways, it seems like a, a, a very natural progression has taken place. Like you say, some of those structures and hierarchies have fallen away. But, you know, a lot of these SMEs were already making precision equipment and, and it's just gone into a different route. So, OK, great. Um, you talked about culture obviously being important. Um, and you, you, you made the um, you mentioned that changing the culture in Japan is like changing the course of a huge cargo ship. And so therefore, you, you know, I like that. It's a great metaphor. You know, it's so difficult. You have to do it very slowly, very steadily in order to to, you know, steer it in a different direction. Um, to what extent? I mean, you kind of hinted at this, but to what extent do you think Japanese corporate workplace culture and practices is impeding that and you know is is it Japanese workplace culture that's behind that slow steady turn um, of the ship or or is there change going I mean you mentioned the free address spaces but you also said it's quite difficult for people to adapt to that so yeah what is it yeah what is it about workplace culture in particular that's you know such a slow well, steady process so, so, so Japan the 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 three norms of Japanese business as I as I Posit them is to be polite and appropriate and don't rock the boat. And the problem, the managerial challenge with this is that you'd never know if people are unhappy. 
But in the United States, if, a, if, a, if an employee is unhappy, you know, <laughs> they'll tell you. Um, and they'll, they'll not mince words, right? No, this is not good. We're doing the wrong thing. We need to go the other way. Um, and that doesn't really happen in Japanese companies. So one has to tread much more carefully, lest people start to boycott the whole thing, right? And quietly, you know, keep running their divisions like they've always run them and so forth, right? And so in order to, uh, to change the culture, it has to be a sort of a very carefully laid out process of involving everybody in the new vision and then um, showcase the right behavior, like the elevator thing, right? So let's all turn this way. Um, and, the, and management has to do that. So the senior managers have to showcase the behavior. They have to celebrate the, the people that are, that are adopting the new behavior. And, and that all takes a lot of effort. And not every leader can do this. It's hard. Changing culture is hard work. And, um, you know, Japan, of course, has a lot of the Japanese companies have the problem that the CEO is only in the office for six years. And so some of them are saying, you know what, this is too hard. I don't want to do this. Hmm. And they, maybe we can go by, maybe, maybe polite is okay, right? Or something like that. So, so, um, so it takes a lot of time to, to even get the buy-in that we have to change. And, mm -hmm. um, and even in the United States, right? Um, culture change can take fairly long. Um, and it's a little bit the, the, the old Warren Buffett line, and, you know, it takes a lifetime to build a good reputation and, it, you know, you can destroy it in a minute. And, um, uh, and, and, and it, it, you can, you can, it takes a long time to build a very good culture, but you can also destroy it very fast. You put, you know, the wrong person at the top and so forth. So it's not a linear process either. And so the, the, the free office, uh, the, the people that work in the free office places actually eventually embrace it, right? But it's, it's, it's not just the work, the employees that need to find new ways to impress their bosses. It's the bosses and the HR function that needs to find new ways to evaluate the people, right? And, mm. and do it in a way that is perceived as fair and just and, and appropriate and right, right? And, um, and then convince them that, that they're fair. And mm. so th this, is, this is a big shift. And the labor shortage and, you know, the, the whole employment system is changing right now. Mm. So the, I, I don't know whether you've heard of the shukatsu. Uh, let me just, so the shukatsu is this, is this uh, annual hiring event. And it's very efficient for HR departments to hire only in April, right? Because they can do the socialization and indoctrination, if you wish. So the onboarding, they can do all of that in, in the summer. And then the training programs are all lockstep and everything happens at a season. And then after five years, they were sent to study abroad and then they come back and everything is lockstep. It's very easy to be an HR manager in, the, in, the, in that setting in a way, right? Um, so the shukatsu was just abolished. It had become so perfunctory and so shallow that it, it had become a show where, uh, you know, thousands of highly educated uh, Japanese 22-year-olds would show up in the same outfit, the same hairdo, the same thing, giving the same answer to the same questions. And uh, basically the companies would just hire by cultural fit. Right? Is this person a fit? to our company culture. And is it just like us? That's completely risk averse. And so everybody has agreed that this is a farce and it, it inhibits studying and inhibits individuality. So let's stop it. And so the first order challenge is that now people can be hired at any time. So they might, you know, come to study in other countries and return to Japan, uh, you know, in a time that is not mm -hmm. large and they can still get a job. And mid-career job changing has also begun. Mm. Still, most people identify as a company, and so there's a lot still about lifetime employment, and lifetime employment is important. It's, it's, uh, it has huge benefits for companies to have lifetime employment. So nobody wants to get rid of it, but we wanna, they want to modify it. So, mm. so there's now much more um, flexibility at the margin, and mm. the, the core remains, but the margin is becoming very flexible. And that allows the high performers to... Uh, craft their individual career path. And it puts pressure on the companies to make sure that they can keep the high performance because there's a labor shortage. So the yeah. companies are rethinking what they do with their best performers and the best performers are rethinking of what kind of relationship they want to have and what kind of work-life balance they want to have. And that plays into this free office, right? Because the free office places are the ones that are competing most for talent. 
And so it's a very exciting point in time to, to go mm. and visit Japanese office places. Unfortunately, we can't go this year, but, but <laughs> it, it will, no worries, uh, Helen, this will, this process will, will keep going. So you can go and. I hope and so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's very no, exciting. Thank you. To, to go in. That will be very interesting to see what happens with the loosening up of shukatsu and mid career hiring, et cetera, and, and the loosening up of recruitment and selection, which um, brings me to another important point. Um, it's often said, you know, that there's the loosening of that rigidity going on, as you said, and it's often said that gender norms and, and gendered employment system is very rigid in Japan and, and policies like womenomics haven't really made much progress, etc. So, you know, in some ways that whether you agree with it or not, obviously, that's that's that kind of social stability that Japan is sticking to those sort of gender norms. But do you do you see that changing? Did you look into that when you were researching the gender relations in Japanese companies? Why is it that gender, in, particularly in the workplace, is is lagging behind? And are any of these rigidities, um, you know, opening up progress for women in Japan? So, so there's a two level answer to that. Um, the the in terms of numbers, if you just look at the statistics, uh, Japan is not lagging. I mean, the U.S. is regressing, but that's a not in numbers, but in numbers, terms but, of yeah, career. But in terms of quite... like um, <laughs> female work participation, um, and and even in like sort of managerial positions, it's nudging up in Japan. So so where Japan is behind, what drags Japan down in these international comparison is politics. Mm. And you you know you could actually quit that. You know the Jap Japanese women are are smart enough to know that politics is nasty and they don't want to do it. I think is actually a big part of this, but but uh, so in politics, uh, women are clearly underrepresented, and that so, so and it looks bad, and you know and you see see these funny pictures of Japanese committee uh, on women issues, and it's twenty men sitting around a table trying to figure out how to improve women issues. And so it's like, what are you doing? Mm. Um, but 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 in the workplace, so in terms of numbers, it's not so bad. And actually, no. national employment systems help because it's 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 um, same wage for all, right? So, for instance, Japan in the in the career tracks, there's no wage differential between the men and women because that's not how the, the Japanese wages until now were determined by size of company. So, so, so you know, it's getting better. There, there are more women. There are also more women in the in the bureaucracies now. So, in the ministries, you go, you, you see women. Um, so then, the second part of that answer, though, is the qualitative situation, right? And so, so whether it's power harassment, sexual harassment, recourse to uh, a workplace situations that are just not okay, um, is is very limited. And that, that's because it's new and people are very nervous, you know? And so um, so men know what mentoring uh, young employees means. It means going to the beer place in the evening and telling them that they misbehaved at the meeting and that they should never do this again, right? That's mentoring, right? So you can't do that. You just spoke out at the wrong time. You know, so it was not appropriate. And they can't do that with women because women don't want to and can't whatever go to these beer places and uh, for, for good reason and, and so mentoring is now moved inside the company but men still have a hard time trying to figure out how to mentor a woman without making mistakes um, and, and we have that issue in the US of course as well with the Me Too movement now men are getting very nervous about you know being you know in situations where they could be accused of things um, so, so all of this is very difficult um, and, and then there is, of course, in, in Japan, the, the, uh, the proverbial Oji-san boss, right? It's a, a, nice, um, a, a nice man who is a little behind in the times and, you know, and has strong conscious or subconscious biases of what the role of women is and they make tea and bring the flowers and so forth. And they get away with open displays of chauvinism without any sanction. And, and as long as they are around, they're, of course, upholding a certain culture. But mm. I've talked to many Japanese women. They're telling me that those, those guys are now the minority. It's no longer not sanctioned, right? So if, you know, open displays of chauvinism no longer are okay in Japanese companies. And so it's, it's changing. It's just that given the business norms of being polite and appropriate and not rocking the boat, 
what it means to lean in and to to help the change progress for Japanese women is, is a little different from what it means for for a woman in the U.S. We can do things like power pose, and and we can we can we can adopt some some mechanisms that that would look really weird in Japan. And at the same time, Japanese women have some other tools available that they can use to to push for change. And it's more quiet. It's more um, it's not it's not as easy to see, but but that doesn't mean it's not happening. Great. Well, it's it's good to hear it might might be changing because, as you said, it's not a numbers game or a participation rate game anymore. It's about that ability to move up the the pipeline and the career progression and and you know change the old guard of management. As you said, there's there's a few too many <laughs> men sitting at the top there of those companies where who are steering the cargo ship still. So. Um, I'm going to let, open it up. I just wanted to mention one thing that you didn't mention in your book, but when you sent us your bio for advertising um, the talk, you mentioned that you're an advisor to startup incubators in Japan. Is that the free address um, offices that you're talking about, or is that something else? I mean, you mentioned that startups are, are quite active in this in this move up the smile curve and upstream, and that is something new. I mean, Japan has always had sort of low levels of startups and entrepreneurships, but is that changing? And and what is that role that you do as an advisor? Can you give us an insight into that side of? Oh so, yeah, so it's it's very very it's a fascinating thing, right? Because in the the Japan. Uh, you know, the, the, the old image of a success story was to be a, sal a salaried employee for, for men, a salaried employee at a large company. And that's where all the talent went if it didn't go to the ministries. So um, so even a, a young, very smart engineer, the dream was to work for Hitachi or Fujitsu or something like that, right? And so... Um, so that began to change only at the turn of the century that uh, it, people were saying, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm very good at in computer science or IT or whatever they are, but I don't want to be part of this huge hierarchy where, where I just become a cog in the, this large thing. I want to do my own thing. And initially, this society was not really celebratory of this, right? So uh, in, in particular, mothers-in-law were, were held up to be against this, right? Oh, my daughter married somebody who quit, who quit the bank and now he's starting a company. Even um, even uh, Mr. Mikitani of Rakuten tells a story. He used to be a banker at the Industrial Bank of Japan and then he quit and he started the e-commerce platform and his mother-in-law said, no. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he, he jokes about it now. I think everybody is very happy there, but um, but but so society was not really supportive. So that has all changed. Uh, that that there is now sort of more of a, a realization that this could be good for for the economy, and the role of the ministries have also changed, right? Because in the old in the post-war Japan. METI, the, the precursor of METI, could just basically, they, they were calling the shots, right? So they were saying, oh, the Americans have developed a technology, say, for the fax machine. Okay, let's make lots of fax machines, right? You, 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 and you, you become fax machine makers. Oh, the Americans have developed a semiconductor, right? You, 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 we become semiconductor companies. And so METI was calling the shot, and then the CEOs basically executed the strategy. But now that Japan is competing that these companies are competing at the technology frontier the, the ministry don't doesn't understand these technologies either right nobody understands technology japan is caught up there's it's no longer is there a sort of a a known goalpost where we just we license the technology and then we make a commercial a consumer product out of it it's it's competing at the frontier and so the ministry has mm -hmm. a new role in providing you know, it's more it's more like ours, or like like what the, what a German or a UK ministry would do, or even the, in in the US, uh, grant give grants to innovative uh, you know activities, help set up an innovation ecosystem, and so uh, out of this have come these initiatives to set up accelerators and build an innovation ecosystem, so to to support startup activities and. Uh, because I'm in California and, you know, and I work with a lot of startups here, I teach a class where my students write a business model for a startup. 
uh, I've been asked, I've been invited to to be on the advisory, or you know, become a fellow and start up activities. And it's very interesting for me. Right? I enjoy meeting the Japanese startups and learn about the challenges that they are having, which are you know a little bit different from here. Uh, the, there's the the venture capitalists in Japan play a very different role from what they do here. And um, so, you know, to, to go through, you know, a sort of roll out a, a business model and a strategy with a Japanese startup is a very interesting experience. And um, I would just say that the people that say that Japan doesn't have any startups haven't been to those places. They are, mm -hmm. and there's, there's actually a biotech cluster, there's an IT cluster, there's a, a lot of um, there, there is, there's not as much sort of apps and the Uber and, you know, Airbnb and sort of those app-based stuff, but there's much more sort of deep tech, mm -hmm. uh, you know, battery technologies and storage technologies, energy technologies, mm -hmm. where Japanese companies compete. Mm. Great. Thank you. Right. Well, I'm going to, um, I'm conscious that people are asking questions in the chat here, so I'm going to open up to some of the questions. Um, we have a question here from Paul. Um, so as part of this business reinvention, he asks, has there been a greater predisposition towards investing internally in Japan rather than overseas? For example, for QC reasons. So he's thinking of the previous Toyota recall problems in the US, for example. So has there been that sort of shift, do you think? Um... Uh, uh, then no, no. Uh, it, 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 perhaps the opposite. So uh, yes, there are. There's a lot of. So if I looked at the private equity market, which is uh, mergers and acquisitions and private equity investment and venture capital investments. And if you look at those data, the the, the majority of activity is domestic. Uh, this has something to do with the choose and focus and consolidation. And so, so Hitachi spins out Hitachi Chemical and then Showa Denko buys that, right? And so you get a lot of activity there. But the largest M&A activities continue to be in out. That is Japanese companies, which have a lot of ca cash, mm. buying, uh, consolidating their global operations, right? So whether that's Suntory buying the Jim Bean, the, the whiskey maker, you might joke that they went to the wrong country. They should have come to Scotland. Or something. <laughs> but um, uh, right, so I wanted to get into into that that market. And um, the Japanese uh, insurance companies. We were talking about the shrinking society. So if you're a life insurance company in Japan, your market is shrinking rapidly, right? So uh, they are actually acquiring foreign life insurance companies. Right, so Meiji, Yasuda bought the standard in Portland and so forth and so on. Um, the car companies are already global operators, right? So 60% of cars that have a Japanese label on it, whether that's Toyota or Honda or Nissan, are no longer made in Japan, right? And so this is a global play. So, um, and, and um, on the, but where do they buy the innovation? Uh, there are more than 250 Japanese companies that have an office in Silicon Valley where they scout, uh, they, they buy, but they also just observe and they see what, mm -hmm. what's going on and what's the action and what are they doing, right? And um, wh where is this headed? And, and, and uh, likewise, I think there are lots of, lots of them are in, in Europe and, and also in Singapore. So, uh, so a lot of this open innovation is a scouting exercise, but also maybe an M&A exercise that let's buy the, the, these startups. Um, and uh, in, so in terms of deal size, so dollars or yen, the global investments are larger, but in terms of number of deals, the domestic uh, deals are, are more frequent. Mm, thank you. Um, a couple of questions here from Chris talking about the business culture. So he said one of the sort of um, traditional ideas on Japanese is that they have slow decision making processes uh, and also they're kind of, you know, risk adverse or have a desire to, you know, avoid or manage uncertainty. So do you see those things changing, those kinds of traits, if you like, of Japanese companies? Yeah, um, I, of course. I mean, the, the, there's, uh, those of us who've spent, you know, time in Japan have encountered this, and it can be very, 
taxing to sit in a, a Japanese meeting or uh, a never ending Japanese meeting. And uh, they're very slow and everybody has to sign off and so forth. And, um, and in some companies, this is changing. So I did a, a number of interviews with uh, companies that, that are very profitable and I wanted to know why they're profitable. And, and in some cases they were, uh, they just had a great business or they had a great strategy figured out. But I also noticed that one of the shared features that they had was that they were actually quite parsimonious. That they were that they were um, they were not wasting time. So they didn't have two receptionists; they only had one, right? And they didn't um, they didn't uh, send ten confirmation emails. <laughs> one <laughs> uh, and, and, and <laughs> that sort of thing, right? And so um, so there are companies that are changing. Um, there, there's a. Let me give you one story that I that I like to tell in this. Uh, when the, the the previous previous CEO of Panasonic wanted to change the culture of Panasonic, and he wanted to particular in particular change the way that his um, direct reports talk to him, because those of us, is, you know, if you know Japanese, you know that it can be very convoluted, right? So. Um, People would say, well, I, mean, I, I asked for your permission to be allowed to submit a proposal that I thought of yesterday. And he didn't want to have these like multi-syllable sentences. So what he did is he asked everybody to uh, make proposals by text message. And, um, and if you do that, you know, you, you, you don't go down that Itadakitai to right? You yeah, you yeah. were typing all day long. Break. <laughs> <laughs> and so the and so they were actually saying, I would like to make the following proposal. And they learned that. And then they went back from text messaging to talking, which was even more efficient. Mm. Um, and so they're working on it. Uh, but yes, absolutely. There it's still there, right? And mm. it's very complicated. And anzenda ichi and nen no tame, and you know, safety and make sure and and, and, and um, and, and I think that will always be Japan's trade. And they will probably lose out on a number of deals, like whether that's foreign M&A deals or, you know, they're just too slow, they miss out on opportunities. But they also may miss out on, um, you know, for, for, their, for, their, for their own good, right? So, mm -hmm. for instance, uh, the whole global financial crisis with its mm -hmm. collateralized debt obligations, they were prohibited in Japan because the Ministry of Finance didn't understand and they didn't allow it. So Japan missed out on that entire. I mean, they, they were they were caught in the in the subsequent recession, but the Japanese financial system actually escaped that thing pretty unscathed. Mm -hmm. And so um, yeah, so it's it, it, it good with bad, you know. So yeah, they will always be slow. They always be careful. Yeah. And and the reason, by the way, there's a reason. If I if I may add this, so the research on this tight loose. Um, of course, looks into why do country, why are some countries loose and why are some countries tight? And what they find is that these these norms, the behavioral norms, have a purpose. They're very pragmatic. If if they don't fulfill a purpose, they will change. People will not adhere to them. So, what is the purpose uh, for Norwegians and South Koreans and 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 uh, and, and, and people in Japan to? To, to have such tight norms. And the, the, the content is different, but the tightness is the same. Right? And the answer is uh, countries that have a lot of exogenous shocks or wars or uh, invasions or um, famines, droughts, earthquakes, for societies to survive those shock events, they have a structured system of, of how to respond. Right, and so the earthquake is, of course, the story that you know, uh, um, and uh, Japan is very concerned about earthquakes, as it should be. There are fifteen hundred a year, and uh, when a, a big event like like Fukushima hap like the the Tohoku earthquake happens, you don't want people to run around and 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 be all frazzled, and you know, you, for for society to to survive these shocks, they need the society needs to be very organized. And then when the shock happens, people adopt these rules as they're sort of, they go on automatic. Right? And that's why there are all these admonish, admonitions. They go in a subway, in a Japanese subway, there are all these rules, right? Don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. You know, don't step, you know, and you have to fall in the line, behind the yellow line, don't jump, don't. And then, and they want people to have this as a sort of a 
you know, they, they, that in a shock situation, they can go on automatic and, and do the right thing. And so I was, uh, I was in Tokyo at the time of the, the you know, 3.11, uh, the Tohoku earthquake. And it was, uh, for a social scientist, it was a very impressive day. I mean, how people really, there was no, there was no looting. There were no outward expressions of panic. Everybody was appropriate. Nobody, everybody was considerate. Nobody draw attention to them. There was no wailing, no screaming, no crying. It was like, okay, um, I am going to be polite or appear to be polite over this. I'm going to be appropriate and I'm going to not rock the boat here. Mm. And so, and, and because that's there, I think Japan will always be tight. Mm. Uh, because it, it, the society needs it to, to survive these events. Okay, interesting theories there. So speaking of shocks, um, somebody asks, what do you think about, you know, the current <laughs> shock that we're all having, the COVID-19 pandemic? Do you think it will have an impact on the processes that you've been discussing and the reinvention of, of business culture? Or do you see it having any impact? At the oh, uh, we, see, we, see tight, we see tight loose in action, right? If you compare <laughs> Japan and the United States, that's, it's tight loose uh, in Japan. Um, and, you know, okay, so there's, there's a complication of how good are our data? Are the Japanese, have, do, do, does Japan have so few cases because they're not testing? Yeah, yeah, but, but we can look at the death rates and it's pretty hard to fudge those numbers, right? And so the death rate in Japan is very low. The, the incidence rate is very low and there has been no politicization of this issue. Um, there has actually, there have been no orders. All that needed to be done is for the governor of Tokyo to say, please, or, and, the, and the prime minister, please practice self-restraint. Be considerate, you know, be appropriate. And the right thing to do right now is not to go out. And of course, wear a mask. And the wear a mask is easy for the Japanese because they do that anyway. They have long had a, a, a mask wearing culture, right? So it's a, whether it's for allergies or whatever. So, so Japan has a, a very, very low incidence rate per capita. And Tokyo is the most densely populated city in the world, right? The entire population of California, a state of 38 million, lives basically on the space of Los Angeles, right? And so, uh, so if, that, if that was in, in the US, this was impossible. So in the US, we now have a, we, we even, you know, people here even discuss whether it's okay, whether we should wear a mask or not. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so the, the answer to, to the COVID pandemic is very tight. Uh, and, and what about it, it, changing um, working styles, like working from home, remote working? Yeah. Like so, that? so the second part of that is the telework is completely, of course, propelling this entire uh, uh, work style change, right? So, um, the the hanko, the uh, this is it's a stamp that that people had to put mm. on. on and um, you can't do a hanko if you're not there in person. So they have now sort of deregulated the hanko, which means that um, that, that was a legal thing. So the Ministry of Justice had to say a uh, signature or a docu sign or whatever it, it is is uh, is valid. But the larger story is that the hanko was also a way of nemawashi, of, of getting buy-in from everybody, right? So you would go around in this large organization and you would, you know, frame the issue such that everybody would eventually put their hanko on it. And once they had their hanko on it, then they could not afterwards complain. It was a process of co-optation, of getting everybody's <laughs> buy-in, of getting everybody's, you know, signature. So now we can't do the hanko anymore, right? And then suddenly we're, okay, we're just going to make decisions and we're going to maybe we're going to just make some of these decisions without getting buy-in from everybody mm -hmm. maybe we're just going to cut these meetings short maybe we're just going to go for outcome here and and the shift to telework this very sudden shift is clearly clearly propelling the work style reforms of 2019 the, the hataraki forward in a way that i think unimagined uh, that, that people work normal hours, that people have dinner with their families, that, um, that the companies allow them to take their computers home. They have to, right? So now uh, people can go home, have, have dinner with their families, and then keep working if there's a lot of work to do. And even mm. the ministry bureaucrats can do that. And so it's, it's definitely changing uh, you know, tremendously. And so it's a huge push. It's a huge shot in the mm. arm. 
I think that's good to see remote working changing and, and the decline of the hunkle. Yay, that's good. Uh, we have a question here from my SOAS colleague, Sarah, who says um, she works with a lot of um, Japanese companies in the UK, Japanese subsidiaries in the UK, and the problem she sees is not with their globalization strategies per se, but rather the way that they deal cross-culturally with people management once they're in other you know, cultures. So they're sort of different approaches to business pro processes, makes them a little bit inflexible when they're operating in other countries like in the UK. So how, how do you see this affecting their globalization and their reinvention strategy? It, that's an that's a, a, ongoing struggle. Right. Um, and it, it won't change anytime soon. So let's not hold our breath. Um, <laughs> but I, I think that, you know, that's, I mentioned earlier, it's hard, right? And so what, what many companies did is they, they equated globalized managerial skills with speaking English. And then they would teach people to speak English. And, and that's, that's good, right? That's helpful. But that's, of course, not being global. A global is a mindset <laughs> thing, right? And so I mentioned I had a, on my slide, I had this uh, innovation tourism chart. So what some of the companies that I look at, right? So at the, at the very top of this, what they're doing is they're taking people out of their comfort zone. They're sending them to a loose setting, right? So, and, and California owns that brand, right? And so they put them on an airplane, you know, go to California and do a design thinking workshop. And then they do this in English. Uh, and, uh, and, and so they're trying to change this one person at a time. And of course that takes forever, but that's maybe the, the only way to do it. And it doesn't work for all people. And so, yes, uh, so you get these office traits still back, you know, in, in foreign countries. But, but I think some of the companies have, have realized this and, and they've realized that this is the one thing that they really have to become more flexible, flexible at, and, and they're trying. Right. And so, um, and so they're they're trying to to change those things, but and the free office and the innovation tourism so all efforts towards that goal, but but yeah, it has to happen almost one person at a time, and so that that'll just take take forever. Hmm. Uh, there's a question here from Liam about the issue of karaoke, um, you know, overwork or death from overwork. Um, do you think companies in Japan are devoting more time to mental health care of their employees and, and looking at issues like that? I guess long working culture, long working hours would tie into that as well. Yeah, so um, uh, so Prime Minister Abe was, was very good at shaming people and companies into doing <laughs> so That's one way to do it, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So the blacklist was a sh list of shame, right? So if 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 you were on on the on the overwork blacklist as a company, that was not good, right? And so um, and so people tried to change this. And then the the 2019 work style reform has introduced mandatory vacation and uh, has prohibited overtime of that sort, right? And so if you're if you're in a in a in a highfalutin profession, consulting, law, accounting, then that doesn't apply. But for but for the the standard rank and file, um, the companies are, can no longer demand that you do overtime over a certain amount, and that's a law, and you could get into into real trouble. Uh, now and, and so that what they what they were trying to do there is to do away with the services on you right the, the, the free overtime work and, and and yet in reality of course people might still do that and so that is that is a that has that has to change and the way that and the government thinks that that has to change because it's it's not good for anybody it's not good for the reputation of Japan or the company or the people so let's change that. Uh, and so, so that's where the shaming came in. And um, and when Densu had this case, you know, the, the, the of a worker that that committed suicide from overwork, and and Densu was really pilfered for that. I mean, they, they were in the headlines because they can't do this, and they had to pay a big penalty. And so, so the the government is getting more proactive around this. So in the old days, it was oh, too bad, you know, it's on then. But now it's like no, 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 you can't do this. Like, you know, this is not okay. So mm -hmm. I think I'm hoping it's changing, um, and uh, and then with more cases that is this is just becoming less and less acceptable. So that that change is happening, and we hear less of it now. I think 
already. It's still there, but I, I think uh, I think that's going the, the right way. Mm. Um, and we have a question here from Satoshi-san, who said is talking about this Japanese type business culture and, and making, you know, making it difficult for change. So he said there's been, you know, some scandals, for example, when um, particularly accounting scandals and things like that at Toshiba. And, and I'm thinking about previous ones like Olympus, where, you know, people people in the company knew that there were problems and, and accounting <laughs> issues and budget issues going on, but nobody raised their head above the parapet, I guess. And so do you think, you know, how how do you think this culture impacts on the achievement of Japanese companies? And, and is there any change going on in that kind of, that's very difficult, yeah, isn't it? That's a, that's a great question. So my interpretation of the, you know, especially the Toshiba case where the CEO was a bad CEO, right? And he has no vision. You know, and, and all he was saying is, you know, cook the books. We want to, you know, increase sales, he said, increase sales. Mm -hmm. And because it was clear that nobody could increase sales, they just cooked the books, right? They're double counting and all kinds of things. Um, and my interpretation is that that's actually not so much a culture, um, although uh, on, on that point, uh, as the famous Hugh Patrick, a professor at Columbia once pointed out, you know, the Japanese scandals are interesting because uh, generally the companies, uh, the, the employees, steal not from the firm but for the firm right they 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 commit a they, they commit they, they engage in scandalous behavior to protect the company not to take something from it um and so uh and so this accounting thing is you know there's uh, these these managers in the tv business unit you know made up sales and i i think that's a challenge of lifetime employment and the rigidity of uh, and the, the lack of mid-career labor mobility. If you're a 45-year-old employee of Toshiba, uh, so too old to change, right? And you're already, you have been 10 years, more than 10 years with the company, so your pension is vested, and you have you have a house and a mortgage and two children, and there is no, you, you cannot just go sideways and join Hitachi. That, that, that still does not exist. That mobility is not there. If you're a 45-year-old employee at at Toshiba, you have no way out than to do this, right? And and there, there's no whistleblower, but you also don't want to be the whistleblower because what are you going to do? You're going to be jobless, right? You're going to lose your job and then you, there's no way to go. So, or or the places you can go are not are insufficient to sustain your, your lifestyle. So, so people are caught and that is changing. And right? so the mm -hmm. lifetime employment rearrangement and what's the right of the worker and what's the responsibility for the company is being redefined right now. And, um, and as that happens, one hopes that, um, that, that employees will, will find ways to speak out and say, I don't, I don't want to steal on behalf of the company. I don't want to cheat on behalf of the company. I, I, I'm done with this, right? I want to do something else. And, and then also, um, this is clearly a leadership issue, right? As in Japan has a leadership challenge that the people at the helm are, you know, Toyota was, uh, Toshi was a special case, but, but Olympus was also maybe a special case, but but it happens, you know, Kobe Steel, the CEO was, a, was, there was, there's nothing wrong other than that he wanted, <laughs> he, he wanted more sales because there was this pressure on profitability and we need more sales. And, and the good people at the shop floor said, okay, fine, we'll just cut some corners. Mm. And um, and then that's just bad leadership. You should just tell it, don't cut corners. You know, we need to we need to find a new strategy to be more profitable. But but it can't be uh, it can't be uh, you know in terms of you know lower quality. It has to be a different way. We have to move up. We have to move towards the technology frontier. We have to increase our prices. We have to do something, uh, but not not cut corners. And then I think uh, it's a sort of the 2080 80 problem, right? So I look at the 20% of companies that can do this and, and can be more profitable without cutting corners, whereas uh, maybe maybe the 80% that are not preparing it well are, you know, struggling. Mm. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm aware of time that we've taken up the 90 minutes we said that, that we were going to take. There were a couple of questions that I didn't get to, I'm sorry, but I think some of them were already covered. People were asking about SMEs and entrepreneurship and womanomics, etc. And I think we did pick up on those in the chat. So sorry if I didn't ask your particular question, but hopefully 
uh, you enjoyed the session anyway, and I think we covered most of the questions. So, I mean, just thank you so much, Ulrika, for joining us in the middle of your busy day. Uh, I'm sure many people want to go off and have dinner now as well, and you have to go, you probably have to go off and teach and go to meetings and things, but thank you for um, for coming along and giving us such a wonderful insight into what's happening. It's it's really it's really important, a lot of those changes that are taking place, and it's really good to see see the changes uh, as through your research. So thank you very much. And um, hopefully we can get you to London again one day when all these travel restrictions are, list, are lifted. And, and hopefully many of us here can get to see each other again and, of course, get back to Japan as well. So, But in the meantime, it's great to have these chats. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank, thank you very much for inviting me. My pleasure. And yes, I will knock on your door as soon as I get. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, thanks everybody. And thank you to everybody who uh, joined today. We had about 70 people there at one point. And thanks to those of you who asked questions. That was great. So I hope you enjoyed it and have a good evening. And uh, enjoy the rest of your summertime, Ulriku, because it's going to be winter soon in California. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank